Okay, um, so uh, we continue with the second presentation. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Raj Kumar uh, Tapa from Nepal. Raj uh, has a bachelor degree in agricultural science from uh, Tribhuvan uh, University in Nepal. He has also uh, conducted uh, training in agriculture in the Arava International Agricultural Training Center and he is currently a, a student in the uh, plant science program as uh, all students uh, are. Raj, please. Hi everybody, I'm Raj from Nepal. Um, the title of my presentation is Testing Genes involved in GA dependent long dangerous flowering in Arabidopsis. We tested three different genes which are GA dependent and, in, and involved in long day induced flowering in Arabidopsis. Firstly, let's start with flowering. Flowering is the conversion of the vegetative phase to reproductive phase and it's just a normal biological phenomena but it has a lot of importance for studying. Why to study flowering? We have to study flowering because we do a lot of agriculture. We put huge effort and money in the agriculture system because the plant will produce flower and fruit and we can feed the huge world populations. And another concept is that now there is a problem of global warming and the, there is shift in the flowering time of the plants. So we need to understand the flowering mechanism to cope with these issues also. So it has a lot of importance of studying flowering. And to study flowering, Arabidopsis thaliana is the model plant because it, is a, it, is a, it has a short life cycle and most of its genes are known to us and it can be easily grown in the lab. Studying about flowering, we should understand what the factors affect flowering. And there are two main important factors like environmental factors and endogenous factors. In environmental factors, light and temperature are the most dominant one. And in endogenous factor, plant internal factors, hormones like GA, oxygen, cytokinin, and in carbo and other is carbohydrate level. The level of carbohydrate also influence the flowering time. Normally more carbohydrate than it flowers earlier and the aging. And these factors all come in one in another way in this pathway. There are various pathways of flowering in Arabidopsis and probably in many other plants. And like vernalization pathway, photoperiodic pathway, zeberlin pathway, and ambient temperature pathway. This pathway interacts with one another, sometimes inhibit one another, and causes flowering in Arabidopsis and many other plants. Let's start with light. How does light affect flowering? And there are two parameters which affect flowering of Arabidopsis by the light. The first is the light period. And all the plants are exposed to light. Some needs light for the more duration, longer period, and some needs for shorter period. Arabidopsis is the facultative long day plants. It means that it flowers earlier in long days, but eventually it flowers in short days, though it takes longer time. And in long day, the, in long day, it stabilizes this constant protein with the immediate target of constant protein is FT protein, a major flowering protein in Arabidopsis and many other plants, and it causes flowering. And another aspect of light which affects flowering is the quality of the light. And there is a, and recent researches have revealed that far, reads, far red light enriched uh, light promotes the flowering than the red light, and in the absence of blue light also, flowering is delayed. It means that fl flowering is promoted by the blue light, blue part of the spectrum. And some researchers said that blue and red light, they alone cannot promote the flowering, but combination, suitable combination of those can promote flowering. So this, the quality of the light and the period of the light affect flowering time. And let's start with the GA biosynthesis. We'll focus more on the GA. And GA is the phytohormone, it's produced in plants. 
and it occurs in, it, it is produced in series of step, but we are more concerned about this step from the conversion of int covering to int covering acid, because in this, this step is blocked by the use, the paclobutazole. This is the chemical which you used in, in our experiments to stop this process and stop the production of GA4 and GA1, which are the active GA species of Arabidopsis. And how does the GA signaling occurs in plants? The plant, plants produce GA and those GA is recepted by the GID1 receptor. This is a receptor of GA. Once GA is binded by the GID1, it binds with SCF complex and it degrades the DELA protein. So GA signaling occurs through the degradation of the DELA protein. And once DELA protein is degraded, the transcription GA TRX and GA transcription factor can be released and the transcription can occur and we can see the function of GA. And in the absence of GA, like when we applied paclobutazole, the GA cannot bind here and it cannot degrade the DELA protein and DELA protein does not leave the GA transcription factor and the transcription does not occur. So we cannot see the, see the role of GA in this case. As in my title, testing genes involved in long day, testing genes involved in GA dependent, long day induced flowering pathway. This is the long day induced flowering pathway. This is the long day and long day induced series of genes. And those, some of those genes are activated by the GA, supposed to be activated by the GA in the, activated by the GA. So in long day, it, it stabilized the constant protein, abbreviated as CO. And this constant protein activates the FT protein, the major floral protein of the Arabidopsis and many other plants. And these proteins move from the leaves to the meristem and it activates SOC1. And the SOC1 activate AGL24 and this FT also activate full. And after AGL24, it activates floral meristem identity genes and it causes flowering. So in my, in my experiment, we focus on these three genes, SOC1, FUL, and FT. These are the three genes, testing three genes for the GA-dependent, long-day-induced flowering of Arabidopsis. That's what the title, that's what the, my title says. So we'll focus on these three genes, SOC1, FUL, and FT. We'll check these three genes, whether these three genes are the target of GA or not. Let's see what does the literature says. And there are some literature saying that the GA promotes the flowering through the regulation of the SOC1 in SOD and through leafy. And there are several other literatures, but still, though there are a lot of literatures about GA, but still we don't know how many genes are activated by the GA. And there's not the clear, and, and there are some errors in this experiment also, because they measure this, the level of SOC1 after four or five weeks of application of GA. So those are not the direct effect. And for this, we need to research some more. And in our experiment, we use paclobutazole as a GA biosynthesis inhibitor in different ecotypes and mutant lines. So the objectives of my study was to measure the effect of paclobutazole on flowering time of Arabidopsis of wild type and mutant lines, and to identify the target genes of GA, and to compare the flowering time in different light conditions. Different light condition here means white light and the combination of blue and far red light. Materials and methods used. Plant materials, Arabidopsis is generally propagated from the seeds, and we use seeds of five types, what, two wild types, Columbia and Lensburg, and mutant lines, three mutant lines, AGL1, also called FUL, on the background of Landsberg, and SOC1 and FT on the background of Columbia. And the growth conditions. Plants were grown on the shown on the tray and kept at four degrees centigrade on the dark, dark room for two days. 
then it was transferred to the control environment Percival of the chamber, which has 22 degrees centigrade and almost 90 to 100 Einstein light intensity and 9 to 15 hours light and dark. So in my experiments, every short day means 9 hour light, 15 hour dark, and long day means 15 hour light and 9 hour dark throughout my experiment. But uh, the plants on the long days and plants on the short days, I kept, I divided the plants of my experiment into plants on the long days and plants on the short days. So plant on the short days means it is kept on short day means 9 hour light and 15 hour dark for throughout the experiment till flowering and long day plants on the long day means it is kept in long day just for a week 20 to 27 days so we distinguish as this the short day plants and long day we keep long day plants for a week from 20 days to 27 days and after it the first Paclo treatment, Paclo Vitrazole treatment was done on 19 days, second was on 22, and third was on 25 days. And the, the growth condition blue, um, growth conditions for blue and far red light were a little bit different. It was um, shown on the tray and kept in dark room and again brought back to the back to the short day conditions till 13 days. And on 13 days, Paclo Vitrazole was applied. And on 14 days, it was moved to the blue and far red light chamber. And the intensity of blue light was 24 Einstein, and far red light was 0 0.45 Einstein, almost zero, and it's a very low intensity light. It is very low compared to the white light ha having almost 100 Einstein. And the duration of blue light is 16 hours, and far red light is eight hours. Chemical treatments, uh, control treatments with was water, DDW with the twin 20 was added with all those chemicals as a surfactants and spreading agents. And the paclobutrazole with low dose and high dose, 10 ppm and 6 ppm. And GA treatment with low dose and high dose with 10 ppm and 5 ppm. And the timing of chemical applications. Chemicals were usually spread on 19, 22, and 25 days unless specified, and they were spread with the hand sprayer to make, which make the fine droplets. And analysis of flowering time was done on, on the basis of the total number of leaves the plant produced before its flowering, and the total number of leaves means the number of cowlin leaves and number of rosette leaves it produced, and it was not on the basis of the number of the days. And the results, the first results is the effect of endogenous GA in flowering of Arabidopsis. Now, we, this on y-axis is the number of leaves, and on x-axis is the number, is the different treatment on long day and short day. We have DDW control, GA, Paclo, Paclobutrazole, and the same treatment. And what we can see here is, the plants flower with, with like 20 to 25 leaves here, and if we add GA, it almost do not have any effect. But if we apply Paclo, it flowers really late in long day, but Paclo does not have effect, no significant effect on short day. But GA has significant effect on short day. So Paclo works in long day, and GA works in short day. Effect of simultaneous application of paclobutazole and GA. And here we try to put together the, mm, at first we spread with the paclo, then after half an hour we applied GA. Why did we do this? Because we want to see the, this is control plants and if we apply paclo, it really flowered later and the, best, the vegetative growth of the plant is retarded. And we want to see if we apply GA together with paclo, can it rescue the Paclo treated phenotype? So we tried with the two different dose, five and 10 ppm GA, then we saw that this both dose can rescue this phenotype. This Paclo treated plant only with this much number of leaves and with Paclo plus GA with 
almost equal number of leaves like control. And it can be more seen clearly in these pictures where this is the control plants and this is the puckler treated plants. It is dwarfed and it flowers really later. But if we apply the <coughs> together with Paklo G also 10 ppm and G 5 ppm, these two plants look similar to these and it flowers almost with similar number of leaves to, to that of the control treated plants. So from this experiment we can say that Paklo treated phenotype can be rescued with the GA rescued with the right amount of G either 5 or 10 both can 10 ppm can rescue the phenotype. <coughs> and the, another result is effect of different doses of paclobutazole on flowering time of wild type of Orobidopsis. We took two wild type of Orobidopsis, Landsberg and Columbia and similar number of leaves and in XX is num treatments for long day, short day and we applied that um, Paclo on 19, 20 and 25 days as I told and we can see that Paclo Butazole does not work on the short day in both, in both ecotypes. It has effect, significant effect on the long day on both ecotype but it doesn't have significant any, any effect on the, under the short day. It might be because this Paclo Butazole all it might be because the plants already produce G till 19 days and it can flower and inhibition does not affect here. And we can see the difference in the long day and short day plants treated with the paclobutazole. And this is the Columbia plants for 40 days on the long day. We can see this is water treated plants. But you can see the effect of paclobutazole. It has slow growth and it, and it flowers really later than really later. But for under short day, the plants look similar and it has almost, sim almost equal number of leaves even under the 70 days and it flowers really later and we can see the difference, difference between the long day and short day plants. In long day, paclobutazole has effect but under short day, paclo does not have effect. And now we comes the main part of our experiment. As in my title, we tested, I told you, we tested three genes for the, as it is the target genes of GA or not. So this is our expectation or hypothesis that if the, mut if the, if the mutant line lost the response to Paclo, it means it, the, if wild type has, if wild type have effect on Paclo and if the mutant line does not have effect on Paclo, then we can say that this mutant line, this mutant, the, this, this, the mutant line for which gene it is mutant, this gene is the target gene of GA. So based on this hypothesis, we, we test these two, three different genes, AGL8, SOC1, and FT10 under long day and short day conditions. Effect of paclobutazole and the first gene we tested were SOC1, 2 under the long day conditions. And here we can see this again on the number of leaves on the y-axis and treatment treatments. C is control treatment, D1 lower dose of paclobutazole, D2 higher dose of paclobutazole. So we can see the, we can see the, the trend of the graph, the slope of the graph is almost similar, but we can see the slope is more steeper in the case of the mutant line. It means that the response of Paclo in this SOC1 to mutant is more stronger. And it is easier to see the effect of Paclo on some other genes if we have these mutant lines. So what we can derive from this experiment is the presence of, pa um, presence of SOC1 um, marks the effect of GA under the long day conditions. Once once we mutate the SOC1, we can see the effect, this big effect. But this has SOC1, normal SOC1, so it's very small effect. If you mutate SOC1, you can see the very big effect. And we take the SOC1 to under the short day also. And here we see that paclobutazole does not have any big effect here, like here we saw in the long day it has 
very big effect, but on the solder, we, we don't see any big effect. So, and the presence of SOC1 marks the effect of GF, but very little, not like as in long day conditions. And, mm, and the second gene we tested were the FT10 gene on the long day conditions and short day conditions. First of all, the long day conditions. We can see that it has a similar trend. This mm, control has the FT10 normal FT gene and it does not have the FT gene. So the paclobitazole works independently of this FT gene. It does not make any difference if it has FT or if it does not have FT. So it's so Paclo works independently of FT and this is not also the FT is not only the direct target gene of GA. And and we checked FT10 under the sorte conditions also and we can see that in Paclo affects the flowering in sod, uh, flowering in sod day condition also for the FT10. And the, what interesting we got here is at this, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the higher dose Paclo treated plants. And we can see that if we add GA, if we add GA or Paclo, then it reduces from like 88 leaves to 50 or 60 leaves. So at this condition, either GA or FT can replace here. And here we can see here, here it contains normal FT and here it does not contain FT. So if we remove FT, so we can see the effect of Paclobitrazole. So in this case, FT marks the effect of the GA under certain conditions. And the third gene we checked were the AGL8 or full under long day and short day conditions. And here we, we can see the almost similar trend in <coughs> almost similar trend in both AGL8 long day and AGL set short day condition. This is this looks similar and this and this look also very similar. So but it has very slight delay and it affects and it responds normally to the uh, normally to GA and I these are not the one which are which we are interested uh, and and this is also not the only direct target genes of GA and the another experiment we did was of the comparing the flowering time in uh, in different light quality and the, f the first light uh, different light quality means we use the white light and the combination of blue and far red light and under white light I told like 90 to 100 Einstein intensity and under blue and far red light we used uh, very low intensity light and these were grown normally grown and this for these plants Pakl was treated on 13 days and transferred on 14 days and we can see that mm, Plants under blue and far red light, they flower really earlier. This is number of leaves. They flower really earlier than the plants under white light conditions. S and we can see that the Paclo does not have effect on blue and far red light condition. This is one, one of the interesting results we got because we can see the difference here. Paclo treated plants and the DDW plants, it has almost 30, 35 leaves difference, but here it's almost no difference. And other interesting things, we didn't find any rose, rose, cowland leaves here, but the plant is still growing. And hopefully we can distinguish between rosette and cowland leaves here. And this, this Paclo vitazole does not have any effect on the, under the blue and far red light conditions. And it may be due to the because of the activity of the high activity of the FT, which is the major flowering gene of the plant. And, and we got similar results with the 35S FT, overexpressed over FT. We got similar results under white light conditions. And in the literature also, they say that far red light condition activate FT. So this might cause the early flowering in our abdopsis in these conditions. And here you can see clearly in the pictures, this with the white light and this with the blue light, blue and far red light, white light this water and this is the paclo treated plants, this is the water and this is the paclo treated plants. We can see the 
difference. It flowers with 22 leaves. It flowers on 10 leaves. These boats on DDW and Paklo under far blue and far red light condition flowered with 10 leaves, but this flowers with 22 and this with almost 50 leaves. So we can clearly see the difference between the plants growing under white light and blue and far red light. So now here comes the conclusion. GA has role in the long day flowering in Arabidopsis as supported by many, many researchers. Um, there is, the role of GA is well established in Sade, but now in recent times the researchers have tried to establish the role of GA in long day also. And GA reduction before the transition to LD, we applied paclobutazole on 19 days and so it reduced the GA and this reduction of GA reduced the ability of long day to cause early flowering as we saw paclobutazole wor works only on the long day conditions and paclobutazole works through the inhibition of GA. It works only through the inhibition of GA and it does not affect any other hormones. So and we saw that paclobutazole plants once we applied GA it can rescue completely with equal num almost equal number of leaves it means that it does not have any any other effect on the hormonal crosstalk and the main result we got was GA does not work through either of the SOC1 three genes we, we tested. It GA does not work through either of SOC1 after your full only but there is the possibility that it may work through either of the combination of SOC1 and FT or full and FT or full and SOC1 or three of them but there is very less possibility that it works through some other genes. So we can try using double mutant lines and identify we, how many genes does the GA, GA works through. And the presence of SOC1 marks the effect of GA under long day conditions and the presence of, presence of FT marks the effect of GA under short day conditions and we are still missing the main targets of GA dependent response because it works independent of these but there is chance that it either of two of them or three of them or some some more can work are the direct targets of the GA and for to identify this we, we started already a new experiment in our lab to identify how many genes does it work GA works through and plants under Plants under blue and far red light flower really are the earlier than the white light and, pac and the most interesting result we got was Paclo does not have effect on the, um, on the wild type Arabidopsis under blue and far red light conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Uh, we have some time for questions, please. Yes, Miriam. In the part of the results, in any graph from the results, you have the number of leaves, and this is the number of leaves when the Arabidopsis first flower or had the first flower, the first inflorescence? Well, in Arabidopsis, it said that it is that one, the total number of leaves uh -huh. does not change once it flowers. So if it flowers in 20 leaves, uh -huh. so after producing one, two, or f mm -hmm. 10 flowers, it does not change it from 20 to 30. So c could it also be like that there, will there could be differences in the total amount of flowers at the end, like to count the, the, f the actual number of flowers? Because they would, they, we can say that it probably started flowering earlier, but the total amount of flowers at the end probably could have been more, no? No, no. We counted this. Sorry, we counted this number of <coughs> leaves. Mm -hmm. Just once we see the floral buds, mm -hmm. now and we sh we counted the leaves, mm -hmm. and that's all we see. And if it flowers in 22 leaves mm -hmm. after 20 producing 22 leaves by the plants, and we saw the floral buds, and that's the mm -hmm. now the plants won't produce any more any more leaves, but it will go on producing flowers. But we don't. We are not interested in the flowers, in the number of the leaves, mm -hmm. how many it produce before it starts to it starts producing flowers for the first time. So the GA couldn't 
you guys were not interested in the effect of GA on the total amount of flowers? No, not on the amount oh, of flowers. Okay. Just the initiation of the flowers on what time. Oh, okay. And the second question was, uh, how do you guys create the, the mutants? Like, how do you make sure that indeed you did silence the gene for that Well, mutant? we get the mutant from the different sources, like from the Arabidopsis research sources from Nottingham and from uh -huh. different okay. labs. Okay. In your experiment, uh, I saw that you used a combination of blue and far red in 16 and 8 hours. Is, is it the optimum or the change makes some difference? The combination of blue and far red is oh, 16 okay. hours by 8 hours, no? Yeah, is, yeah. It the, it, is it the optimum or the changes might cause difference? Well, we can try with the different senses, but uh, the basic thing is we use blue light for the normal photosynthesis of plants and far red light as because we, we think it activates the FT. So you, we, we tried with this combination, but we can try with some other if combinations. Far red, if far red is to activate the fluorescence or flowering, mm. then why don't you increase the, le the time for the application of far red light? Well, when for flowering, far red is better, but for the normal photosynthesis of plant and for the plant to survive, it needs blue light also because we know blue light is photosynthetically active, so it needs blue light also. Okay, but why don't you use then 12, 12 hours then? It induces flowering and it will be earlier, no? Yeah, yeah, we, c yeah, we can use uh, mm, tw 12 hours and some other combination also, yeah. In introduction portion, you mentioned that uh, uh, in Avidosis, uh, the active uh, gibberellin is G, GA4 and GA1. But why you use the GA3 in your experiment? Well, GA3 are, are most commercially available, and, and it is said that GA3 is the most stable, but the com commercially available GA4, they are not most more stable and once you apply it on the plant it has to be stable so that the plants absorbs so if we apply GA4 it will degrade with the time and the plants cannot absorb it nicely as GA3 uh, I have similar question with uh, Miriam I just I was to mention about the number of leaves uh, yeah. Why not maybe the number of days to flowering? Why, why you stick to this uh, parameter? It, I, in my yeah. belief, it doesn't represent. Uh, um, it may not time. represent flowering. Instead of you can use number of days to flower. Well, yeah, we can use the number of days also, but for the consistency. If you grow plants under the same light conditions and same temperature, in two chamber you'll find that one will flower in 40 days and one flower in 50, 55 days. But, it almost, but the both plant will have almost 20, 20 or 22 leaves for the, this Columbia, Columbia wild type this. And another, another concept is that we are not counting the rate of production of the leaves. We are in more interested in the developmental switches from the vegetative to the reproductive. So, we are, this number of leaves means the growth stays and how much the plant has developed. So, so, so we looked into how, after how, producing how many plants, the plants t now t thinks that n now will change to the floral mm, reproductive phase. So it's, we are more concerned about switching the developmental phase and not with the rate of production of the leaves. And this is more consistent than the counting uh, the number of days. Uh, you showed that uh, Paclo uh. did not influence the plants that uh, were induced with red, with far red, and uh, with blue light. This. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is your explanation for that? I mean. Yeah. Why Paclo didn't work here? Yeah. Yeah, I told you that in literatures they said that the far red light, this activates the FT protein. 
So FT protein is the major flowering protein. If the plants have enough FT, it flowers earlier. So if, so it might activate the FT protein and and though even we have the, even the plant does not have the GA, it might recover. So it could be the GA was not involved and it worked through no, yeah, a different uh, pathway. Involved. Yeah, GA, because we reduced the level of GA by applying paclobutrazole. So GA was not involved here. So even in the absence of GA, we have enough FT, which is a major flowering hormone. So it can flower in normal. So period. could it be a different pathway that doesn't work through GA? I mean, do you have any idea what pathway it could be? Yeah, it works through the FT. Yeah, yeah, I understand, but something has to act to induce the FT, right? Something has to? To, to induce the yeah, FT. This is the far red light. Ah, so it works directly. We think so. The far red light activates FT, okay. and many researchers also supported this concept. In your method, and to observe the effect of short day and long day, you put the short day plant in the whole life in the short day period. But you put the long day plant uh, in the certain period of, of the experiment only. Why you didn't put the, uh, for the, in the whole time, the mm -hmm. whole uh, time, the long day plant? Well, the thing that you told were tried by the several researchers before, but now, the new concept, the, as I saw here, <coughs> putting only one week. Just keeping only one week is a new concept and is tried now. And we want to see that the level of gibberlin is higher from this 19 days. And we want to stop the GA at this level. And before the, plan, before the researchers Mm, put the plants under the long day from the beginning, but now it's we want to be accurate on the timing because from this time the now the plants things to change to uh, start uh, development of the flowering. So we want to just capture the moment at this not throughout the whole period of the life. Um, Raj, you, uh, you check the effect of Pakra on the transition by counting the flowering time, by yeah. counting leaves, yeah. right? Uh, how do you think that the Pakra would uh, uh, affect the expression level of the, uh, of the target genes of SOC1 and uh, FO? On these? The, the expression level yeah. of them. After we, if we check the After applying the Pakra. Immediately on the 19 and 22. Yes. Well, how long, how long afterwards uh, does it affect the <sighs> amount of time uh, that we know uh, that SOC1 uh, level uh, is, uh, changes upon uh, yeah. an application of uh, a certain treatment? Mm. We've seen something like this. Um, and how do you think it will affect the uh, level of expression? Well, after applying PACLO, it needs few hours, few hours to stop the geobiosynthesis. And it will the s the level of SOC1 and some of the genes, yeah, it will go on decreasing with the time. It will decrease. Yeah. No, no. You need a microphone. Meanwhile, I will ask the question yeah. till the microphone gets there. Okay, Raj. Yeah. I, I tend. To I tend, first of all, before I look at genes and mutants, and to look how the plants look like. Yeah. And when looking at your photographs, the plant treated with Paclo seem to me very poor, as if as if their entire performance and growth is is suppressed by the Paclo. Yeah. So not only, I mean, it's not they they develop normally with the same shape of leaf, the same size of leaves, but they will produce more leaves until they reach flowering. Mm. But they also look very poor. Well, what do you have to say about this? I mean, maybe 
it's all effect of just suppressing the plant, putting it in, uh, under stress, suppressing the, its, its entire development, and that's why it is flowering late. Well, so for this... Show us the photographs, okay. please. This one. The Paclo. Yeah. Well, you mean that Paclo can affect some other genes and some other phenomenon of the plants, not only it is stopped the geobiosynthesis. Right. Wait. You treat with the when the water we treat and this with the paclobutazole. Yeah, paclo affects the vegetative growth of the plants. We consider right. this. But these two plants were also treated with paclo. But together with paclo, they were treated with the GA also. So these and these plants flowers with almost equal number of leaves, like the control, like the plants treated with water. So we can say that even if we apply paclo, then we, we apply Paclo and Gia, then it, it can rescue the plant like this with equal number of leaves. Okay, we can consider that the plants does not have, mm, does not have the equal height or the equal canopy shape, but we are more interested in the number of the leaves, how much number of the leaves a plant produces before flowering. And if we look this, it produces almost like 20, 20, and 20 leaves, but it produces 50 leaves. So we can say that for us in this experiment, it does not affect our flowering time. Let me develop further the question. I okay. mean, I'm, I don't know anything mm -hmm. about flowering and okay. inducing flowering, etc. But still, let's say, let me ask this. Maybe the trigger is that the plant has to have a certain leaf area until it starts flowering. Yeah. So here, the leaves are smaller. It has to produce more leaves until it will flower. Yeah, it has to produce. Yeah, we see. Because this is because of the deficiency of the GA. And GA obviously has role in the growth and development cell division and cell elongations. Yeah, we consider that. Yeah, but the main parameter we uh, we consider for the flowering time was the number of leaves it produced. And the, the effect of paclobutazole means the absence of the GA. But so is uh, there a clear hmm. indication that the paclobutrazole affects directly the flowering uh, 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 in uh, the flowering induction processes, or it maybe it works due to uh, uh, in inducing smaller leaves, etc., and through no, that no. It, it will postpone no. flowering. Till now, what we know is paclobutazole does not have other effect. It just stopped the one step I saw it in the from the conversion of intercaurin to intercaurinic acid. So it, it stopped that process. So GA cannot form in the plant. And in the absence of GA, the plant cannot develop like the normal mm -hmm. plant, so it looks dwarf. Okay, Raj, as far as I know, Arabidopsis is not an agricultural crop yet. It's a weed. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> what I wanted to ask you, if you have any ideas how to use your conclusions in practical agriculture. Well, the study of flowering, we, mm, Arabidopsis is a model plant, and we from this model plant, we want to understand what is the flowering mechanism. How can we, I want to tell that the first, the FT gene I told you, it was discovered in Arabidopsis, and now, now it's the similar FT-like gene is found in tomato and many other plants. What we find from Arabidopsis is like FT activates, FT promotes flowering. So if we overexpress FT-like gene or FT in plants like tomato, we can have early flowering. So in our lab, uh, other, uh, my friend is, uh, sees, what's, what she's doing is she's inserting the FT protein on the tomato, and we, and we are going to look if the tomato plants flower really early or not, or not. Can you think about something with the light? What? With the light, with without the light? genetic transformation. Yeah. Well, <coughs> here I told you that this plant activates FT. So now all the, now in our lab we most, they use 35S overexpress FT. Instead of using this, we can grow plants in blue and powdered like conditions. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, and uh, especially thanks to Raj for the good presentation and, and very uh, intensive discussion. And we'll move on to the next speaker. Um,
Our next speaker is uh, Monica Garcia Teruel from uh, Mexico. She gradu graduated uh, in agricultural engineering from uh, Tech de Monterrey in Mexico. And afterwards, she works in, uh, worked in the Lunar Greenhouse Project in uh, Arizona in the United States. Uh, and, uh, and then she came here to do her master's degree in, the, in our program. And uh, Monica will give us uh, her presentation on characterization of uh, ornithogalum accessions by morphological traits and resistance to uh, Pectobacterium uh, carotovorum. Okay. Good morning, everybody. As as you already mentioned, I'm going to talk about ornithogalum characterization by morphological traits and resistance to Pectobacterium carotoborum. Ornithogalum is a genus of herbaceous bulbous perennials belonging to the family Yacentaceae. Uh, this flower is native from South um, uh, Africa and it has colors sorry, from uh, white to yellow, to, do, to deep orange. Some members of this genus are used as ornamentals either for cut flowers or pot plants production, depending on some character, characteristics, mainly morpholo morphology, such as inflorescence size and number of flowers. And commercial bulb production of ornithogalum is mainly concentrated in Israel, South Africa, Netherlands, and United States. In fact, Israel is responsible for the 80% of the flower sales at the European market during the winter se uh, season with a total sales of 15 million euros. A few species of Ornithogalum are known for their high susceptibility to subroot bacteria, Pectobacterium carotoborum, carotoborum specifically. Uh, this bacteria uh, produces, produces pectolytic enzymes that causes the softening of the tissue and eventually its complete maceration. Indeed, the susceptibility of ornithogalum to this pathogen is the main limiting factor for its development and production. Uh, this pathogen enters mainly through stomata or goons, and we can see here uh, colonization of this pathogen in the intercellular spaces and the complete maceration of the chloroplast. And here we can see a uh, complete macerated bulb. Uh, today, the main uh, control is through cultural practices, and there is no chemical control existence. Because of this, uh, the, only, the only option is through breeding. And according to previous research, some cultivars and species of ornithogalum are more resistant to, uh, than others to Pectobacterium. But even so, there are no reports of a uh, design screen for resistance against this pathogen in the genus. Taken together, this study intended to find a species and cultivars suitable for inter- and intraspecific breeding towards more resistant ornithogalum varieties. Uh, this study was divided in two sections. The first one was uh, with greenhouse plants where morphological traits, <coughs> biochemical assays, and bacterial resistant assay was measured. And the second part in tissue culture, rate of, of growth and development of plants in vitro were recorded and bacterial resistant assay. The first part, the greenhouse plants, which were grown in a polycarbonate greenhouse, uh, 13 lines were used in this section, which were divided in four different groups depending on the species, Dubium, Thyrsoides, Arabicum, and some hybrids. And the first experiment was the measurement of morphological traits. This was performed for three months, twice a week. Uh, the leaf length and width of the first two developed leaves, we wanted to see if there was some correlation with the development of the inflorescence and the flowering, the inflorescence length, number of open flowers, and the size of one open flower per each inflorescence. Here uh, we found first the inflorescence size, 
as we can see, uh, the groups, the lines that got the biggest inflorescences were Tirsoides and Arabicum with an average of 60 to 70 centimeters. Uh, we can also see that the Dubium group were, were much more smaller in general and they reach uh, a, high, a height of maximum 40 centimeters, uh, uh, more or less. And in the hybrids, uh, we can see that they reach an intermediate size. Uh, this characteristic is really important because for cut uh, flowers, it is more desired in fluorescences equal or greater than 50 centimeters, whereas for pot plants, it's better to have inflorescences uh, less than 50 centimeters. Also, we can observe that, for example, the, the line 452 was one of the most uniform in development in this group. And we see that the 99, 49, 60 reached a plateau really soon in the season and didn't continue developing more. And these two lines, 23 and 25, had a really slow development at the beginning and then at the end they, they had a, 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 more, a faster development. Then we have the average number of flowers, where the most flowers were seen in the Tirsoides group with a total of uh, 74 flowers. And then uh, we got the most flowers in the hybrids was the line 281. And in the Dubium, the uh, YV was the most, uh, whereas the lines with the least number of flowers were these two also in dubium. We can also see an interesting trait that some lines started to flower from the beginning of the season and continue building flowers all along, whereas others like this one just flowers at the end of the season and almost open all the flowers at the same time. This is also very interesting because again, for cut flowers, we, we want all the flowers to open up at once, whereas for pot, flower, for pot plants, we want uh, flowers all along the season. So here we can see the differences, and the hybrids might be better for pot, for pot plants because they mostly just open up <laughs> all the flowers at the same time. We also had uh, the size of the flowers, where the biggest flower was in the Arabicum, the Tirsoides, um, sorry, this uh, graph is divided in groups. The red is Dubium, this is Tirsoides, Arabicum, and hybrids. So here also in Tirsoides we see a very big flower. Uh, we also see that the hybrids got intermediate uh, flower size between these lines and the smallest flowers were concentrated here in these lines. We can see uh, this result better here, a comparison of color and size of the flowers. Again, we have the biggest flower, Arabicum and Tirsoides. And then we see that Dubium has much more uh, smaller flowers. And the hybrids got an intermediate size, except for this one. But it, this is very interesting because we can see that the size of the flower can be inherited to the offspring as well as the color because we have very deep uh, orange colors here and white here, whereas we have um, a more moderate yellow in the offspring. And then uh, we, we did some biochemical assay to measure the indirect resistance to the bacteria. And this because we have, it has been seen in other studies, especially in potato, that the level of phenols and the activity of, ens of some enzymes like tyrosinase and peroxidase are related to the resistance to Pectobacterium carotoborum, and they even uh, co uh, correlate with each other for this. So uh, for the protein activity assay, first we did the protein extraction using two biological repeats from young leaves of each ornithogallum line. And then we, we moved to the protein assay using BioRAD assay for quantification. Then the enzymatic assay, we use different buffers. We use DOPA to measure the tyrosinase activity. 
and we uh, use TMB for peroxidase activity. Afterwards, we read the absorbance at different uh, levels for different buffers. Uh, for this one, uh, we see that um, the highest level was seen in thyroides and the lowest levels were seen in dubium. Uh, however, uh, the levels of protein were lower than expected. And here also for tyrosinase, we see that the levels are more uniform along the, the lines with the exception of the YB in the dubium. But um, even though we have some differences in the lines, uh, we believe that the, the, low, the levels were very low because of the, of the physiology, physio physiological stage of the plant at the time of the, of the sampling. Uh, because for uh, practical purposes, we made the measurements at advanced stages of flowering. So I think uh, measuring this early in the season would also be helpful to observe the level of activity of the proteins. Uh, then we have the polyphenolic concentration, and this was done also using two biological repeats per line. Then the samples were fractionated with hexane to remove hydrophobic residues. The phenolics assay using phenol reagent and then we measure the absorbance and at 735 nanometers. Here uh, we can observe that the levels were higher. We got a really high levels of phenols and we can see a trend that the hybrids reach a really good levels, whereas Arabicum reach really low levels. Uh, this line also had really uh, high levels. And however, as we are going to see further, this, uh, this chart doesn't reflect previous results where the phenolics level is correlated strongly with the resistance to the bacteria. And because Arabicum was seen that it was really uh, resistant to the bacteria, further analysis have to be done at early stages to, to see this. And finally, we did the resistant assays uh, on leaf ac accession disks. First, uh, we prepared bacterial cells with GFP protein. Then 20 mi millimeter leaf disks were placed in dishes like this one. And each leaf disk was pierced at the center and infected with bacterial suspension. After this, uh, they were pre-incubated at 22 centigrades for 24 hours and then transferred to incubation at 28 hours centigrades for 24 hours. Here we can see the leaf discs four hours, uh, 48 hours post-infection with PCC. Uh, here we can see some differences, whereas this is almost completely clean. We see uh, intermediate level of infection till a complete maceration of the leaf discs. We can also see this here. This was uh, taken in a binocular using GFP protein and white light. First, we see the control, which was a very susceptible line belonging to the dubium group, which is known that is uh, very susceptible. Then we can see the negative control. We can see non-infection here. And then we see again <laughs> Arabicum, which is very resistant. And then uh, 452 belonging to the dubium group also with a medium resistant. Uh, the re to, to measure the resistant, we measure the average area in millimeters of infection and the percentage of, list of this infected. As we can see, the control was completely infected, whereas we got non-infection and the negative control. And then we see that the most susceptible lines were in the dubium group, this one too. And then the most resistant lines were Arabicum, Thyrsoides, and the hybrids got really good levels as well. So here we also see that there was some correlation between the level of proteins, phenols, and the resistant 
in the hybrids. We got really good resistance in the hybrids. However, uh, we didn't really get correlation in the YB, which presented really high levels of phenols. However, it was susceptible. And also Arabicum. And then uh, tissue culture. Uh, here we work with 16 lines. Again, we divided these lines in the four different groups. And then uh, we started with the tissue culture propagation. Uh, young leaf segments were used to generate cayuses and produce cell cultures of each ornithogallum line. For these, we used leaf segments. Uh, we cut it into small size square pieces and grown into media uh, with hormones. After that, they were incubated in a growth chamber at 24 centigrade with 14, 10 hours light dark cycle. Afterwards, we transplanted the plantlets into a new medium without hormones. Then after 70 days, uh, we transfer again uh, the plantlets into the same medium. And later, uh, we transfer the plantlets into a hormone without sugar to prepare it for bacterial infection. Here we can see the small square pieces, the initial tissue culture, and, and then we see the development of the bulblets, shoots and roots, the, f the first stages, and then the last stage where we only transplanted five plantlets per each flask. And then what we observed was that the fastest development in a total of 23 weeks was seen in these two lines that were the hybrids, whereas in these other lines, we also saw a good development, but a little bit smaller. And the lines that didn't react at all were these ones. So we couldn't use these lines to, to do the bacterial infection. So for the resistant assay, uh, we used 10 leaf segments of 20 <coughs> millimeters uh, of ornithogallum lines in an angle shaped, as we can see here. We place it in a petri dish, and then fresh cultures of uh, pectobacterium were prepared for inoculation. And then the bacteria culture was poured in the middle of each petri dish. And finally, they were incubated in the growth room at 22 centigrades. Uh, the main symptoms we could <laughs> observe in this assay was the colonization not only in the tissue, but also in the media. We saw yellowish and softening of the tissue, and we saw some bending of the, of the segments. So f we did the first observation after seven days, and this was very interesting because mostly all the lines were still green. Uh, we can see the negative control completely perfect. Also, the, the positive control was still green. And we just started to observe a little bit of yellowish. We did a second of observation after 10 days, and then um, we could observe much more the symptoms. Here in the positive control, the tissue was already completely macerated and really yellowish. And in general, in the other lines, we started to see some bending, much more bending, and uh, bigger colonization of the bacteria in the medium. And as a difference, in the control, we could only mostly see the infection in the tissue, whereas in the other lines, we also saw it in the medium. So the results was that um, in the Thyrsoides uh, group, this 0036 was more resistant than this line, but but uh, both were really good and both produced some rooting. This was really interesting to see that besides the bacterial infection, actually uh, the thyrsoides lines started to root. Also, this belongs to the thyrsoides and produced the biggest roots. And this is believed that the qu this quality of thyrsoides for rooting may propose that they can also be propagated by, by leaf segments. We also saw that in the hybrids, 
uh, this one looked more resistant than this one. And this line had a medium resistance, and this was expected because it belongs to the dubium uh, group. And again, this is the most susceptible one. We can see the example of the hybrids again here. Here we have the parents. This is a very susceptible line in the dubium group. And this is a thyrsoides, which is known that it's very resistant. This is 10 days post-infection, and we can see that this tissue is already getting macerated, whereas this looks really uh, good. And we can see intermediate resistance in these two lines, but however, we can see some differences in the resistance. This, again, was more resistant than this one. And uh, to conclude, this, it was very useful to separate the lines in, in groups because this allowed to see that some traits were transferred to the hybrids, such as the resistance, such as the flower size and color. And we saw very important traits in founding Arabicum, and this was very interesting to see because it is the first time that such a resistant analysis is made in this uh, line. Uh, also, the thyrsoides groups uh, show very good resistance, whereas the dubium uh, were very susceptible. However, the dubium are, have interesting traits in flower color for the pre breeding programs. And uh, biochemical assays need further replicates and correlation. We believe that we need to do uh, more assays along the season to make comparison of the protein levels and activity because at the moment we made it, uh, the proteins were already degrading. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, you uh, were using several methods to uh, several methods to uh, describe the uh, resistance of your lines. Uh, one was on leaves, one on uh, seedlings or shoots, young shoots. Yeah. Then you took the shoots and you uh, put them in, uh, in a tissue culture or on uh, agar, and you checked. Uh, did you see any differences? Uh, between the lines when you're comparing all these methods or all these methods gave you the same results? Uh, you mean the resistance in vivo and in vitro? You have different methods, yeah, that you did. Yeah. Uh, all of them showed you the same trend for all the cultivars that you checked? Yeah, we have a general trends like uh, the dubium always showed uh, the most susceptible resistance and then the, the thyrsoides, uh, the thyrsoides was really interesting because we observed the resistance both in vivo and in vitro because we were able to propagate them in vitro. So we saw that in both, um, in both systems it was resistant. Arabicum, on the other hand, um, we believe that it's a very interesting uh, line to use it in breeding programs. However, it hasn't been able, even, even in other studies, to propagate in tissue culture. So we cannot uh, related to it. That's the reason why you didn't. Yeah, some lines didn't uh, react to tissue culture. And also the hybrids, we saw that uh, they got intermediate resistance in both in vitro and in vivo. And for example, in vitro, we have uh, a lot of uh, systems that you can use to, to see the resistance. And we used specifically this one because we had a very few material, but we have other protocols that. I don't know, it might look different. Monica, how is this disease distributed in, uh, in agricultural fields or greenhouses? How, how is, it, is, is it transmitted from one plant to the other, from one field to the other? Yeah, uh, it is. Um, the, uh, the bulblets uh, have to be changed uh, every, uh, every short periods 
because the infection uh, gets transmitted through the bulbs and the leaves. And uh, well, uh, I don't know in other countries if it's really distributed, but at least here in Israel, it's a big problem, and also in South Africa. But once I have a greenhouse with with the clean from the disease and the bulbs are clean, then because how do they become yeah. how do they become infected? Because it's an opportunistic bacteria, so it enters through wounds. So especially if the workers are not careful with the tools, it can be easily transmitted by the, by the workers or by uh, not uh, having the, the proper cleaning. And it enters also through stomata. So yeah, it, it is very contagious between the plants. Iris, Rosal <laughs> How long time you wait to see the result of the bacterial infection assay? Hmm? After how many hours or after how many days you you took the result of the bacterial infection assay? Which one, the in vitro or in vivo? Both. Uh, the in vivo was measured after 24, 48 hours, <laughs> and then the in vitro was after seven and 10 days. And did you have some replicates also? Uh, no, we only did once. Okay. We we had replicates. Uh, I mean, different petri dishes, replicates for yeah. the lines, but yeah. we didn't repeat the experiments afterwards. Okay. In your result, there was a line which has higher phenolic compound within it, but the uh, resistance was poor. That means the resistance is not related to the phenolic compound. What is your conclusion about it? It is believed that it is uh, correlated. That the thing is that um, we did the, the sampling at uh, a late flowering stage. So at this stage, we believe that some of the compounds were already uh, uh, degrading. And for example, um, Um, well, never mind. Uh, the YB, we saw really low levels of phenols, and however, it was very mm -hmm. uh, susceptible. When we did the, the experiment, this line was still flowering, was still uh, at developing, whereas in Arabicum, we got really low levels of phenols, and we really high resistant. And this was because the Arabicum was much more uh, uh, senescing. The flowers were already dying, drying. Mm -hmm. So we believe that this affected the results. That means if you take the same plant line in different growth condition, they will perform different? Yeah, I think uh, we believe that if we do this analysis in different uh, stages, especially at early flowering, we can see uh, more active uh, levels of proteins and phenols. Okay, thank you. Monica, after doing all this uh, work in the greenhouse and at the lab, can you actually give a recommendation for the next breeding program, I mean for next year? Do you have any ideas what should be the best lines and uh, cultivars to, to try? Yeah, um, I think uh, Arabicum and Thersoides would be really interesting lines uh, for, for resistant uh, and also for big flowers. Uh, the hybrids would be, I think, uh, interesting to grow them for pot plants because they bear the flowers uh, at the end of the season. They open all the flowers at the same time. Uh, also, it would be interesting to find uh, a way to propagate Arabicum in tissue culture and find if uh, we can observe the same resistance here. And the dubiums were, would be very interesting for the flower color.
Other question, please? Yes, Indira, here. This small question, how to add the negative control? <coughs> I'm just curious about that. Ah, I'm sorry. Uh, the negative control was not infected. We only put water on it, and the positive control was infected with the bacteria. We use for this uh, dubium line, which already we already know that it's very susceptible. Are there any other questions, please? Okay, so thank you very much, Monica. Thank you. This uh, actually ends our uh, morning session. We shall uh, now uh, take a longer break uh, for lunch until one uh, fifteen. Uh, so at one fifteen, we will be back here to continue. One fifteen.